Okay, well, I'm Gregory O'Brien. I write books. I, um, I edited a book about the New Zealand school journal, A Nest of Singing Birds, in 2007, which <clears throat> was published to coincide with the 100th birthday of the journal. Um, I've been an art curator. I've illustrated books. I've written books. I think of myself mostly as being a poet, um, poet artist, maybe. Um, and for the most part of my life, self-employed and working very much on projects. Okay, well, I was approached by some people from, um, <clears throat> from Learning Media, it was at the time. Um, um, they were planning to do this publication to mark the 100th birthday. Um, the reason I did it was, I mean, in some ways, I don't think I was the logical person to get to do this kind of book, but... Um, in the years leading up to that, I'd done a lot, of, a number of projects which had involved the school journal, um, or the elements of the school journal. I wrote a book on um, John Drawbridge, in which um, I remember being quite amazed. We reproduced old school publications that he had illustrated, and he talked about the school journal as being quite a, a major sort of um, influence in his life. Um, also, we, we knew Mar Margaret Mahi pretty well. You know, and the school journal had been a huge thing for her, and she had a fierce loyalty to the school journal. Um, so just across the whole sphere, James K. Baxter's poems written for the school journal. He was an editor. Um, we knew Alistair Campbell. We knew so many people that had actually been involved in it. Um, I'd met Juliet Peter, who was a picture editor there. So kind of like um, in some kind of um, through happenstance and through working as a curator at the City Gallery, you know, I'd curated shows by people like Juliet Peter and Janet Paul and John Drawbridge and um, I think they must have lined me up and thought well here's someone with a foot in the door but also someone who's from outside the organisation because I think it would have been a very hard book to get written if you knew someone in the organisation and also someone who was in a way answerable to the whole history you know it would be it would have been a 10 year research job you know it would have been an impossible thing to do I had about 18 months to do it as I recall and so um it, what the job wasn't to go in there and talk about it, you know, the, the committee meetings and the evolution of the, 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 um, the journal um, and its changing roles in the society at large. And all these things are touched on in my book, but in the end it was, it was really just um, they wanted a curator just to come in and see what he saw. And so, um, and, you know, and, and also read, obviously, and respond to the text. So... Um, so for me, it was great. It was a great learning experience. It was, um, you know, a lot of trawling through archives, but finding remarkable things all the time, finding great work by people I'd never heard of, but also, you know, very importantly, I think, also finding all this work by, you know, by people like, you know, Colin McCann, Gordon Walters, Robin White, um, um, Graham Percy, um, uh, Roderick Finlayson, James K. Baxter, you know, Peter Bland, um, Margaret Mahi, Janet Frame, you know, all this sort of stuff. So it was a real, um, it was like living a genie out of a bottle, really. And so I think um, the brief for the book was to make it a celebration of the journal. So um, that's sort of what I did. I presented a book which um, included samples from lots of the writing. So it was meant to be like a, a little bit of an organic reenactment of moments in the um, history of the journal. Um, brought back lots of the um, artworks. Um, and... I'd like to think the book really was the start of some kind of longer term kind of um, investigation really into the history of the journal, which I guess is what you guys are doing today, um, which is fantastic because I was aware that the book that I did of some 160, 170 pages was really the tip of the iceberg and there was so much more to, to be sort of talked about and be found out about. Um, but a great project and a great feeling and it was launched at the National Library in 2007 with an exhibition alongside and I remember um, Helen Clark launched the book and she waved it around above her head, sort of threatening to bash anyone on the head who didn't buy a copy. And, um, and, and Margaret Ma, he made a great speech and cut the cake, the 100th birthday cake, as I recall. And the exhibition went for about six months and um, it really, it, it, it felt like a, a real milestone, actually. So, um, so yeah, we're looking forward to birthdays to come in the future from now, I guess. The 125th will be the next big one, I guess. I think there was a kind of a, almost a shared idealism at, and at times an optimism in a lot of the contributors. I think people um, contributed to the journal and they believed they were actually 
working on something that was worth doing in terms of providing this kind of material. And this was different material during di different decades. But actually, there was a sense of belief that this was that New Zealand was getting better and going places and becoming fairer and and more alive than it was before. So I do think perhaps the big takeaway here was that thing. It was about it was idealistic. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't a workaday place. It, um, they obviously had deadlines and schedules, and also they did some journals that were terrible and others that were stunningly brilliant. You know, it wasn't. Um, that's part of the game. That's part of any creative enterprise. I think you almost need to be willing to fall over to stand up properly. You know, it's part of the deal. But I do think just that underlying sense of, um, and even up to the point in government that it was being administered. They're probably not an they're not a mirror to New Zealand society, no. Because as I say, I think there's probably more aspiration, and you know, and it was it did have a mission, which was to get people to read, you know. So it was based on various ideas about learning and the way learning empowers people. So in a way, it wasn't trying to reflect people back exactly as they are, but was trying to sort of open them up and maybe energize them a bit. So it's sort of um, it was part of a process that was ongoing rather than being a set of sort of real steps along the way. Alistair Campbell was appointed, you know, who was a Cook Island Māori in the late 1950s. Um, and Roy Cowan was the art director and he was Napui, you know. So you ended up having some pretty key, powerful people. Mm. Um, not, not overtly or ostens ostentatiously so, but you had a number of Māori people working in there. And also there were other forms of government publishing. There was Te Aho uh, going alongside the, the Māori Journal. There was, um, so there was, a, and a lot of the people were writing for, for the same journals too. So the school journals and school pubs wasn't totally in isolation to what else was going on. But I think, um, yeah, you could see it becoming, moving from being a kind of a peripheral concern to being at the heart of it. And certainly I think by the... Um, you know, by the 60s and the 70s, and also increasingly the whole Pacifica Polynesian thing, which has been a huge thing in the last few decades. Although, having said that, I, do, I was asked to write about Robin White a while ago, haven't got around to doing it yet, and I did do a journal on Jeff Thompson. I wrote a school journal about him about 10 years ago, and I wrote about a half a journal on um, John Poulet. So I actually have written, I've written, I wrote one on Jill, Jill McDonald. So, so there is, I like the way they, I like the way they might be thinking that their past is something that's worth hanging on to because it certainly is. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's sort of because probably those worlds aren't quite as close as they used to be. But then the world's a different place. There's a different energy. You know, um, it does seem when you look back at the old journals, they do reflect a world where people could take things a bit quieter. That's tricky, no, because there are some, um, oh, no, no, I, I, I couldn't go there. You know, I've got, I've got, I've got about a hundred that I think of. I've got, like, my A-list, and there's a whole lot of them. Um, but when I, look, when I look back, I find there are certain works I find really moving. I find Roy Cowan and Juliet Peter, who are a married couple, both of whom worked as editors at the journal, as well as contributors to the journal. I do find there's something very affecting about their life's work together, and their work for the journal and their art together. And interestingly, both Roy Cowan and Juliet Peter now, in terms of their paintings and their ceramics, are being collected a lot more. And they're sort of, um, so I sort of think they're probably, I'm sure there'll be some art historians out there that, as well as this bigger picture to the school journal, there are people in the story that there's a lot more to say about too. In terms of, yeah, so again, I, I, so I don't know what's going on, but also because it's very complicated. I mean, this whole thing, it was a little bit of a Rubik's Cube, you know, with these part one journals, and they do four parts per year, but then they'd also do readers, and they'd also do poetry readers, okay, you know, once a year for a while, and then there'd be all these bullet school bulletins coming in the side towns to live in. So you actually had, it was actually a lot of publishing, um, and, um, and they'd do remedial things, and, you know, they'd... Um, but then the extent now to which some of reading is done online, I'm not, that again, I'm not sure about that. Does that mean yeah, today yeah. with the school journal, can you get this That's school journal as a PDF that you can yeah. read on your screen yeah. or on your Kindle? 
Yeah, or whatever you've got. There are other things that have changed. I mean, because originally the school journal was given to kids to keep, so that meant the adults read it a lot. Then for a time it was given to kids for a week, and then they took them back and they used to keep them at school. But I'm not quite sure what they're doing now. I mean, if they have class, they used to have class sets. But prior to that, each kid, the kids used to get them to keep, which meant they became part of people's home libraries, which is pretty amazing. Um, um, but then now I don't know, maybe they just exist as a PDF. I really don't know. But yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, that sort of Mervyn Taylor, you know, done beautifully.